Learn more about resistance starches and how you can make those foods tasty for you and incorporate them in your diet and within your culture or just, you know, like find it in a fast food restaurant so that it's easy for you to make sure you're eating that resistance starches, whether that's oats and beans and you know, if you can't digest those things, then figure out a way uh, to change your gut microbiome so that you can, because it will make such a big difference in your in your gut, your liver, your skin, your brain. So you just read this passage. Yes. And so what, what did you get out of it and what do you want to share? What's so fascinating to me is that the gut microbiome does not stay only within the gut. And over the years, I've learned that 70% of the immune system is in the gut associated lymphoid tissue and in the gut microbiome. So keeping our guts healthy, our digestive system healthy is so key and important, but not just because it, you know, supports our immune system local, but there's this virtual, it's becoming known as a virtual organ because it's traveling around the body, communicating with other organ systems, like our brain, like there's this well, gut brain access, they call it. So if your gut's healthy, your brain's happier, for example, because the organisms in our gut impact how our brain processes or thinks and, and how we feel energy wise. So what's fascinating to me is there's also more research on this gut liver access and how emerging research is showing that a lot of liver disease, even viral hepatitis, non-alcoholic hepatitis, so like NASH, which is like an emerging problem because of type 2 diabetes and the metabolic uh, syndrome that's happening more in our Western diets, our lifestyle. More and more people are having issues with their liver. They may not know that they have issues, that they might feel tired and bloated and lethargic and, and uh, might have creeping cholesterol and high blood pressure. And emotionally, uh, emotionally, and emotional too. stress, like anger, irritability, they don't know. Uh, they might go into a Chinese medicine doctor or an naturopathic doctor and find out and then go to the, the lab and do an ultrasound and confirm it or see it on blood work and see high liver enzymes. But guess what? It might actually not show up. Sometimes, you know, you don't see it on blood work or an ultrasound until later years. So it's Im important to recognize that too. Uh, does that mean that we just throw a probiotic in there and problem solved. <laughs> Just take a good bacteria that impact your gut microbiome. It's not that simple. It's important to look at, you know, the whole picture and, you know, it doesn't mean, okay, we need good bacteria and we need food for that good bacteria, which is prebiotics. Everybody gets confused. Like what's a probiotic versus a prebiotic? Probiotics are the good bacteria within that little microbiome and that good bacteria needs food. And the food would be fiber and resistant starches, which we mentioned in our previous episode. And resistant starch would be thing like an examples, like practical examples would be like root vegetables, like potatoes and sweet potatoes, boiled, not turned into chips, uh, like you know, uh, you know, yam fries in a nice like a home oven would be fine, but actual potato chips would not serve the purpose of adding resistant starch to your gut microbiome. Uh, round rice. So and let's quinoa, let's dial it. Sorry, I'm gonna, I, I just wanted to cut in for a moment, just uh -huh. to slow it down, and have people fully understand what you're saying here. So probiotics are the good bacteria that we want to foster and have more of, because there's yes. also bad bacteria, and they can proliferate, and that causes problems. Uh -huh. So what do we do? We need to feed the good, and get rid of the bad. Yeah. If you don't have the good, you don't feel good. And if you have not enough good fiber in your diet, you those good bacteria die off. Yes. So if you are lacking in resistant stat starches in your diet and eating a very refined diet, you might not even know you're eating a refined diet. You might be eating breads that say they're whole grain or whole wheat, for example, and thinking, well, you know, I don't understand why I'm constantly constipated. I'll go to the bathroom once a week. My bread says it's whole grain and it has fiber in it, but we want you to eat foods that have not been kind of processed and milled to build the the uh, prebiotic levels in your gut. Or perhaps if you can't break that down, let's say you get really gassy and bloated when you have oats and 
brown rice and that's a problem, then you can temporarily use a resistance charge fiber supplement to help you. It's really important to get the plug unplugged. Like if you're constipated, you're going to feel really like toxic and tired because then you're reabsorbing that poop water basically. So you feel unhealthy, bloated, and tired. But if you can unplug and make sure your digestive tract is moving, then you're feeding um, with good bacteria. Perhaps you're taking a probiotic or if you can tolerate yogurt, you can get it that way or sour fermented foods. But you want resistance starches that don't break down so that you can feed like they ferment and then feed that good bacteria. Ultimately, you don't want to be reliant on uh, supplementation, but sometimes taking supplements in the beginning can help you do the unplug and restore the good bacteria. Perhaps, perhaps you've been kind of on various antibiotics, maybe even to deal with an imbalanced bacteria like H. pylori or you know, you've know had C. difficile or some other bacteria overgrowth. Yes, and and that is so prevalent now the H pylori, and and then you end up having all these digestive discomforts and reflux and heartburn and all that, and it's yeah challenging I'd like to, do to a take full care. Episode on that and bring a gastroenterologist to talk about it. Sounds great. Let's okay. do it. Mm-hmm. But let the, for now, let's continue to with this conversation. And so, when you speak to probiotic, then and just using it temporarily, is that what you're saying? Versus taking it re- on the regular, like a uh, you know, but one a day vitamin kind of thing that people used to do. So do you or do you not subscribe to people taking probiotics every day? I don't recommend it every day. No. If somebody is pregnant, I may recommend it in the uh, second or third trimester to help uh, ship the gut microbiome so that they're less likely to get, you know, conditions like um uh, group B strep, which is, a, you know, you, you get tested for and it can impact your labor and you might have to take antibiotics. There is some research to show when you take probiotics in pregnancy, it can reduce the incidence of allergies in your children. Um, and there's a lot of that going on, you know, allergies to various things, dairy, peanuts and such. Um, and uh, probiotics in times where you've taken antibiotics, but newer literature research shows that it, you, you want to when you take an antibiotic, you want to take a break on the probiotics during that time and then wait a bit, let your own gut try to do its work and then add in the probiotic. Or if someone's having, uh, for example, recurring yeast infections or bladder infections and you want to cut the cycle, that's a good time to take probiotics. Really, in the end of the day, you want to rely on the least number of supplements possible. And you know, if you've been on several for a while, because you're trying to resolve a few deficiencies and issues, you know, taking a break from them completely to give your liver a break is a good idea. Um, perhaps doing an elimination, uh, liver detoxification, changing up your nutrition, and then going back on things that you might have deficiencies in. But maybe part of the problem is that, you know, the the gut microbiome needs that shift so you can start absorbing nutrients again. People with H. pylori often have low iron and low vitamin B12. And the moment you shift that microbiome, kill off the H. pylori to start with bacteria, the iron all goes up and they don't need to take the iron anymore. Wow. So this is great because I think there's a lot of people that do take probiotics every day. So for those that are listening, um, (laughs) take Tanya's lead and maybe actually just talk to Tanya about this because it's like, "Hmm, do I just keep going with it? And what's the impact? What's the impact if they're taking it every day? do really well on probiotics in the moment they stop, like perhaps their leg cells too busy to eat in a way that they can give enough prebiotics or eat enough prebiotics to be able to maintain that good bacteria level. Um, I think that in those types of circumstances, a nutrition shift might be indicated or perhaps they have had a ton of antibiotics and they need a longer you know, regime of probiotics or perhaps If they've stopped and then their symptoms come back, maybe they need to start rotating or shifting the good bacteria that they're taking because every company has different strains and subspecies and, uh, you know, strain numbers. And I think the more varied our gut bacteria is, the bigger the immune system, like the stronger the immune system and the better our digestion. So if you're staying on the same probiotic all the time, that could be an issue. Perhaps you're just, you stop it and it like, you know, it, you're reliant on it. So you just need a bigger bite to like squeeze out the unfriendly commensal bacteria, commensal meaning like 
the bacteria that houses up and doesn't really support us in a good way, but can it overgrow and cause problems if, um, you know, if it's overgrown, it can become pathogenic. So, and basically what you're saying then really is you need direction. It's just don't haphazardly take it because it can have a impact on your body. And and yep. I actually liked how you said in terms of even taking antibiotics, because people still do take it. I know a lot of doctors will avoid it as much as possible, but it's still very prevalent. It's still being utilized a lot to antibiotics. So um, to not to take it, like what I got out of that is like, don't actually take it while you're taking the antibiotics. So how long would you wait before you actually take it? Yeah, a week, your, your body a week to kind of let the its own, you know, uh, good bacteria to build and then top it. Right. Okay. And then how long would you take it for? Depends on how long and strong the course of antibiotics you had, how many times you've had it. It's variable, but I would say finish a bottle as an example if someone's done like a short course of antibiotics. That's awesome. Right? Like, let's say you have a sinus infection and, you know, you just took, you know, it's been confirmed and it gave you relief to take the antibiotics within 24 to 48 hours. You keep taking the antibiotic and then it's gone. And then you wait a week and then you take the probiotics for like a month, for example. Right. You know, a good, good dose. And obviously anything that bothers you or irritates you, like if a probiotic you're taking and it gives you diarrhea or ships things and you don't feel well, stop it. Don't continue thinking. You know, the longer you take it, it's going to, you know, help. Yes. Yes. That's a really good point. So I guess to recap, and um, it's people, it's like a buzzword. People talk about probiotics. And really, it's a matter of knowing what the heck it is. How, what does it do for your body? And then actually taking prebiotic foods that will help supplement these probiotics is the good, friendly bacteria to help you stay healthy and strong. And to keep them around. Yeah. And, and then keep the probiotics around. Yeah, lo- those yeah. good bacteria around, like giving it the food. So if someone, for example, came in to me as a patient and said, you know, I, uh, I'm constantly, you know, tired and bloated. And when I eat beans and the things you're wanting to me eat, like me to eat like um, uh, beans and, and cruciferous family of vegetables, like broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage, they get bloated. So they kind of steer away and they're and they're following a low thought mouth diet. That to me is a bit of a red flag that they're lacking in good bacteria uh, because those are the enzymes along with other parts of the digestive system. Perhaps they're stressed and like not producing enzymes because they're like not going into like, you know, relax mode and chewing their food. They're just like eating on the go. So um, that can be a component of of, uh, poor digestion too. But they're, they can't break down these foods, so they turn to what's called the FODMAP diet, and uh, and they're avoiding those, um, you know, lectins and galactins. They're all the, they're avoiding lactose, for example. They're avoiding all those gassy vegetables. Well, you can't avoid, avoid, avoid forever. What you want to do is find the resistant starches that you can eat, give the and take a probiotic to feed the good bacteria, so that over time you can start shifting your whole gut flora and take out the refined stuff because you're thinking, oh, I'm eating, I can eat bread and I feel fine, but then generally I'm bloated. Um, and I can't eat Christopher's family because that makes me really gassy and I'm constipated all the time. As an example, that might be a patient report. So it's like kind of scaling back and going, okay, well, let's just clear out of all the refined stuff, the sugar. We know it's not helping, it's not feeding you, it's not giving you energy. But now how can we shift it so that you can break down those gassy vegetables eventually, um, trying to find, you know, the resistant starches that your body can assimilate. Perhaps it's starting, like we were saying, like, you know, uh, in a previous episode, you know, uh, resistant starch in a fiber supplement, as an example, and a probiotic in a supplement and starting really basic and, you know, drinking bone broth or, or Asian broth to like, ease the gastric system and and doing all cooked foods for a while so like just reset and then from there starting to add in those carbohydrates that used to cause gas because the goal is to not be dependent on being uh, like only eating like breads and pastas because something that doesn't make you feel bloated and gassy but you're constipated all the time so it's like trying to 
like get to the root cause. Does that make sense? I think it really makes sense. And, you know, if you are constipated and gassy and bloated all the time, it's just a reflection that things aren't moving. And as you said in the previous episode, it's like you're all literally plugged up. And to address actually from the other episode, which you guys need to go back and listen to or watch, um, you said something about, you know, inability for the water to be reabsorbed. And that's actually what the um, function of the large intestines is to actually reabsorb water. So if you're already like a mess, you're reabsorbing crap, no pun intended. Yeah, poop water. <laughs> poop water, right? Yeah. So if how's that at. healthy? Going yeah, it's through not... your body. So it's going right. through your body. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when, when they call it, re, the, you know, you hear the buzz term leaky gut or yes. increased yes. intestinal permeability, that's literally, you know, you're, you're, you're constipated perhaps. And then the intestinal wall might be, it's all microscopic. You can't take a scope and see that intestinal permeability, but you feel the impact of that. The poop water is being reabsorbed. Your joints are hurting. You're tired. You're feeling sluggish. Or you're just, you know, not in a good space mentally, physically, um, and and or you're getting migraines or anywhere that genetically you have a weakness. It's triggering that. Uh, and then the moment you work on your gut and your digestive tract, you know, a huge so, portion of that goes away. It's not going to be perfection. Maybe it is, but it makes a huge difference. So biggest message is work on your gut and your microbiome. Yes. Fix your digestion and everything gets better. And just a fun fact, since we're talking about gut bact or bacteria in general in the body, 90% of our body is actually filled with bacterial cells. So we have a lot more bacteria cells than we have our own personal cells. Yeah, it's like we're living image. in community, right? Like, yeah. ooh. If, we're, if we were to take <laughs> away our skin, our bones, our tissue, our organs, you could see the microbiome of Tanya, just like if you could see yes. microbes. Like right. you, I would have a, a, like you would be able to still see if we could see microbes, like my outline, that's how much bacteria yes. we are. So we 39, wanna... 39 trillion cells wow. are bacteria in our body. We're about, fun, you know, yeah. It's fun crazy. facts, love it. Fun facts. So <laughs> I like that. basically, you know, we don't want to feed all the bad bacteria. Like this is a reality, guys. And what do they like? They love quick sugars. So you're just feeding that. That's why, you know, when people get candida, everybody talks about yeast and candida, right? They don't bring that up as much anymore, but that's a reality. It's like, are you feeding the yeast? Because if you are, then it's just your issues are going to continue. It can even extrapolate to our skin too and everywhere, right? Like we were talking yes. about these different accesses. Well, our skin flora is an extension of our gut. So um, kind of strange. In fact, I don't know if you want to put the glutes in the podcast, but there's, you know, rosacea. Yes. Well, there's definitely, I don't know if you see a connection between obviously stress, but food and rosacea. Yes. Um, but there's this little alcohol. Demodex, like an alcohol. Yeah. Um, there's a little bacteria called Demodex that sits on the skin and there's more of it. And we all have it, but there's more of that particular bacteria in people with rosacea. And it's a strange little um, micro uh, organism, it literally hides in our hair follicles after it, it meets in there and then comes out. It doesn't have a uh, colon or like an exit point, so it just explodes on our face. <laughs> and so if it's we have pooping more, on your face, it's is literally, what you're saying. <laughs> like it explodes. Oh, nice. But, yeah, I know. It's so gross. But like, so silly fun fact, right? And then the thing is, is that we have more of those when we have a rosacea. So things like metrogel and like antimicrobials, things that kill and take that away. But really, if you ship the gut and you change what you're eating, you don't necessarily have to do those topical treatments or maybe you do a combination to lower the levels so that you have a better bite. You build up the good bacteria and change your immune system and it impacts your skin. I, that's one example of like a funny little microbe. We're just full of them. We are, <laughs> yes, we are full of them yeah, and full of it. Like, we're yeah. full of it. Oh, that's awesome. They're taking over. <laughs> yeah. So to to oh totally recap, like what is your like one liner? What are you going to tell people to do and with regards to Learn this? more about resistance charges and how you can make those foods tasty for you and incorporate them into your diet and within your culture or just, you know, like find it in a fast food restaurant. So 
that it's easy for you to make sure you're eating enough resistant starches, whether that's oats and beans and quinoa. And if you can't digest those things, then figure out a way uh, to change your gut microbiome so that you can, because it will make such a big difference in your, in your gut, your liver, your skin, your brain. Awesome. Well, that went by way too fast. And so if you got something out of this, go, come back and listen to it again. And because there's just so much jam-packed information that you can utilize in your life and share it with your friends and family. And we are going to rock it. We're going to talk to you more about things that are super relevant in your life. You don't even know about it. 